If you've been subscribed to me for a while now, you may recall a video where I tested out a new batch of trimming tools that arrived. Well, it's time for another, as a long-awaited package arrived that contains handmade trimmers made by arguably the very best pottery tool maker out there, and so I couldn't resist throwing a batch of bowls just to test them on. I feel I need to preface this video by saying this isn't an advert, and I haven't been paid to make a review about these. I'm simply a potter who gets overly excited at the prospect of new, sharp tools, and those made by Philip Poe Berker of Bison Tools are probably the best out there, or at least they're the best I've tried yet. I should too make another note here, as these tools aren't easy to get a hold of, and Phil usually has a waiting list of about five to six months, if not longer, and the only way to place an order is to send an email to him directly. When ordering, he requests the dimensions of your hands, that way the handles of the trimmers can be turned on the lathe to fit them perfectly, which makes holding and using these such a pleasure. There's also a couple of styles of handle you can choose from too, but I typically always go with the same one, which is the carver style, as they have nice indents around the top, close to the blade, which I can really firmly grip, sort of like when you hold a pencil. For this order of tools, I purchased two new shapes and two more which I already own and have become quite dependent on and I figured that having a backup of each isn't a bad idea. And this last trimmer, wrapped in orange, is probably the one I'm most excited to test out as it's a much smaller and finer blade than any of the others and I'm hoping it'll replace a turning tool that I've been using to trim the feet of my bowls that's practically worn out. So, these are the two replacements for my old ones. The bottom one is more of a loop tool which is excellent for when I want to remove a lot of clay at once. And the other is a hook tool, which is better for detailed work and for trimming a lot of clay away, but in a more focused manner. The blades of these tools are made from tungsten carbide, which means they're incredibly sharp and strong and should last for years, but the metal itself is brittle. And if these are dropped on the floor, there's quite a high chance that the blade could crack or shatter or chip. These are the two new shapes, the smaller loop with a lovely dual colored handle and this slightly larger one, which has a curved edge, which I'm hoping will be similar to the hook tool by means of being able to apply pressure from a very focused point on the blade to remove clay quickly in a more controlled manner without having to use the corner of the hook tool, which is what I currently use, which can be somewhat awkward at times when the angle isn't quite right. It's such a treat using tools that are purposefully made for a process. For so many years, I used turning tools that really had very little effort put into them, which is understandable because in most cases the metal used wears away really quite quickly when used against coarse clay, as ceramic is such an abrasive material. The same can be said really about any tool used for the making of pottery, for the throwing and trimming stages at least, and some of my throwing kidneys and other tools like throwing sticks are completely different shapes now as compared to what they were like when I got them. And here's how I grip them when I use them, with the back end of the handle pushed firmly against my palm, with my index finger pushed into this groove around the top and my thumb below it. It feels incredibly ergonomic, which makes for a welcome change after spending years using turning tools that are essentially just sticks of wood with blades on one end. These are the polar opposite of that, and as these sharp blades take years to dull, I find myself becoming really quite attached to some of these tools, especially as they become so important in your making practice. And as I trim all my pots quite excessively, it really helps to have the very best to turn them with. Yet, I do think there's quite a steep learning curve that comes when using tools like this, and I actually wouldn't recommend them if you are a beginner, as they can at times be quite difficult to control, and when used against coarse stoneware clay bodies, you need to contend with things like chattering, and you really need a firm grasp on the process, as one wrong move with a slightly blunted normal turning tool won't destroy the pot, but these tools, as they are so sharp, can gouge huge amounts away very easily, and they can get caught on the clay, tearing the whole pot out of place or even your skin if you're not careful. These are also much more expensive as compared to normal turning tools. And when you're first learning to trim pots and you're still getting the hang of it, an awful lot of things do go wrong. And I think it's better to build up experience with lesser tools before moving on to these. And ultimately when trimming pots, I think the most important thing is to just gain a lot of practice. Purchasing sharp new tools won't suddenly make you a better trimmer. It's experience that matters most. And even a well-trained potter can use bad turning tools to trim a nice pot. Your hands are the most important tool of all, especially so at the throwing and turning stages. When trimming, so that all my feet have the same diameter. I score this circle in which measures about six centimeters across. The clay inside will become the foot and everything outside that line will be removed. And this will be the first trimming tool I test, which is the Robustus series round top narrow C. 
which trimmed away wonderfully from a very focus point, which seems to be the best way to turn pots without any real chattering occurring. And you can see just how quickly it rips through this leather hard clay. Although as you'll see later on, I think one of the other tools does a slightly better job of removing clay from this outer portion. So much of it really is situational, and with experience you'll find the shapes that suit you and the pots you make. What's perhaps just as important as the tools at this stage is the condition of the clay itself. If it's too firm or too soft at this stage, it actually only makes the process more difficult. Next, for trimming the foot, I'll be using this miniature half inch series loop A, and I bought this really specifically to turn these two facets on the foot ring, as the tool which I've currently been using to do this process is completely worn out, the metal of the blade being a few hairs widths thick and it works wonderfully beyond just trimming those details on the foot. Although as the corners of the blade are curved, I couldn't quite get the angle I'd like, which intersects where the bowl meets the foot. It almost gets it, but it leaves me with a slightly rounded groove, when in fact I want a much sharper corner. So I found myself having to go back to the wafer thin blade that I've been using for years now. There is though an advantage to using these blunter tools, as it seems with this slightly grogged stoneware clay, they leave a polished, slightly burnished surface, as compared to the tungsten carbide which tears through so vigorously they can leave a surface that's quite rough, and as the foot of these pots will ultimately be the only portion that's left with bare clay showing, I may always turn the lowest portion of the foot with one of my blunter tools just to give it the finish I like. Next I'll use this hook tool to trim the top of the bowl flat, which, as this tool has such a flat edge, is perfect for this job. Together with trimming all the straight sided vessels I make, it may be the turning tool I use most. I then switch to the miniature loop tool to try and hollow out the inside of the footwell, but the angle of the blade and the position I have to hold the tool doesn't quite work, so I switch back to the cheaper turning tool I always use for this process, which isn't nearly as sharp and it means I have to apply a lot more downward pressure for it to gouge out the clay. With this tool I can position it at a much steeper angle and it still slices away the clay as the blade's edge is so thin. Whereas with the bison turning tool, whilst the blade's edge is very thin, the actual middle portion of the blade is quite thick. And this means that it only really works well when held at one specific angle. Whereas this ancient trimmer with the thin blade is a bit more versatile and it is perfect for this job. But I do wish there was a tungsten carbide equivalent. My aim at this point when trimming the pot is to hollow out the footwell so it's the same depth as the walls on the outside of the foot ring. This lower facet of the foot, which is the one that won't be glazed, is then stamped with my maker's mark. Pushing the stamp in does displace some clay up, creating a small bump. So once stamped, I do just trim over the top one last time, and I also check this lower groove just to make sure it's nice and crisp where the walls meet the foot. These trim bowls are then set aside, and as they're so thin at this point, it only takes them a couple of hours to dry out. When trimming pots, there's one thing you'll see me do a lot, which is tap centering. This is the process of getting the pot to spin perfectly in the middle of the wheel. And for this, I use a process called tap centering, which I have made a whole video dedicated to, which you can find in the description below or on screen now. To do this, I spin the wheel slowly and I tap the bowl whenever it comes to its most undulating point, hitting it more or less in the same spot until the bowl comes to rest right in the middle of the wheel. I've thrown these bowls with some excess clay in the foot, so when I am tap centering, I'm aiming to center the rim of the bowl, and if the foot portion is slightly off center, that doesn't matter, as I'll be able to trim it to be perfectly true. I then push three lumps of soft clay around the rim, and whenever I do this, I brace the bowl from the opposite side, or from above, just so the bowl isn't pushed off center, as it's fastened in place. I then use a potter's needle and my measured calipers to score the base, and for the beginning of this bowl I tried to use the miniature loop tool again, just because I really wanted to see just how much damage it can do. And whilst it does melt through the clay like butter, the whole process would take entirely too long if I only used this small blade. As I turn these bowls, you'll also see with my left hand that I constantly push down through the base of the pot. This helps it stay in place, as if one of my tools were to catch and I didn't have a hand bracing it, the bowl would likely leap up out of its restraints and the vessel could very easily be damaged beyond repair. As you can see though, this tool is better for the details. Instead, the one I've come to love and use for removing clay at the beginning is the full-size standard series loop A and I'll let the footage explain why. 
The shape of the blade just suits these forms so much, and with it I can remove a ton of clay at once, which speeds up the beginning stages of trimming a bowl tremendously, so I tend to use the larger bladed tools at first, and then I use a finer one for the details. So for the rest of this batch of bowls, I trim the feet using this miniature loop just to get the rough shape and to remove most of the mass. And then just to really define the edges and to sort of burnish the clay of the foot ring, I switch back to my old paper thin turning tool to just crisp up the edges so at least it's getting less use and should last a bit longer. If there's any other potters watching who've used a tool until the metal edge gets so thin, you'll know how lovely it is to use as it's so incredibly sharp. And then one sad day the metal snaps, rendering the tool useless. If the outside form isn't quite where I want it to be, I sometimes roll this trimming tool over the surface it isn't too sharp, but it does have a very fine point, and with it I tuck the tip almost horizontally to meet the foot ring and to get the entire curve of the outside of the bowl exactly how I want it. I also use my fingertips just to burnish the clay, just to soften any edges a touch if they are incredibly sharp. The most important thing when trimming these bowls is getting the foot ring to be the same diameter time and time again. This helps them stack when not in use very neatly, which means the pots must be trimmed accurately. In terms of stackability though, what's perhaps more important than trimming the outside form is how accurately the inside form of the pot has been thrown. As if the interior shape for each of the pots you've made is different, then they'll have no chance of stacking nicely. And I'll show that now by cutting one of these pots in half. And although it might look okay, this pot was a reject as I trimmed the foot well too deeply, resulting in the base splitting. You'll be able to see that the clay inside the foot is far too thin, but otherwise it's a good demonstration of how finely my pots are turned. Here's where it cracked. But once stacked together, you can see that actually the only parts of the pot that come into contact with each other are the foot rings. The walls of the vessels don't touch, which means when these are piled up, the weight is passed quite evenly from piece to piece through the foot rings of the bowls, which creates a strong column when they're all piled up. And it's why I can safely bisque fire about 10 or 12 of these, as none of the walls or the rims of these are taking any of the weight. But if the thrown curves of these walls differed from piece to piece, or the internal depth from pot to pot was different, then there's a chance the walls of these bowls might collide. That doesn't mean you need to throw it perfectly every time, and if you do spot a small discrepancy you can correct it at this point, which I usually do just with a metal kidney which I skim over the interior surface. And yes, this is a very different shape bowl, and I don't expect it to stack with the others, but the theory remains true. This burnishing of the inside is something I even do if this slip has dried in a pattern which I don't quite like, as it leaves some raised prominent marks. So I quickly scrape clean the inside surface, and usually the pot is held in place simply by the downward pressure I'm applying with the metal kidney, which mimics the action my fingers of my left hand are doing now. For this bowl I trim the lowest portion of the rim first, before fastening the bowl in place with three lumps of clay. This clay that I use for holding the bowl in place quickly dries out throughout the day as I'm turning, so periodically I take the three lumps off and submerge them in water. I keep them submerged for a dozen seconds, and then I remove the clay and roll it back into a soft, usable state. That way I'm not wasting tons of clay a day, just as a means of holding the pot against the wheel. I wanted this bowl to have an outward sloping rim, which would be comfortable to drink from, together with a curved body and then a tall, elegant foot ring. Although in this instance, I felt like the foot ring may be slightly too tall, so by using my hook trimming tool, I turn the base to be lower. Next, the grooves and the foot ring are trimmed in. And then, if I find there are too many facets to the outside curve of the pot, I take a relatively soft metal kidney and I curve it to match the exterior form and I hold it in place, pushing down slightly, which removes any of the more prominent maker's marks. Lastly, I begin hollowing out the footwell. I grasp the trimming tool in a tight fist and I force it firmly into the thick expanse of clay left in the foot, removing the clay layer by layer instead of trying to be rid of it all in one movement. The clay inside the foot is usually a bit softer than what it was like on the outside, which means I can use less pressure the deeper down I go. And as I turn this portion of the pot, I'm constantly aware about how the clay moves beneath the tool, as if I feel the underside begin to bow inward slightly. I know I've probably trimmed down slightly too far, but as long as you stop at that point, it's usually fine, as long as the interior form isn't too badly indented by how the tool's pushed from underneath it. 
and once I'm happy with the shape and size of the foot, I'll do a few passes on the inside just to clean up the form. And then, like always, the bowl is stamped with my maker's mark. The excess clay that's pushed up can be removed and the edges burnished. And that's another bowl finished. It's always such a joy using new turning tools, especially for turning through those thick regions of clay on the outside of these bowls. With any luck, Phil's turning tools should last a good portion of my life, and I do take good care of them. They're kept in a padded box, so they can't accidentally roll off and smash onto the floor, and they're regularly cleaned and never kept damp. The sharpness of these tools makes certain trimming jobs feel so easy, yet there are times where they can be slightly difficult to control, and they certainly take some getting used to. Otherwise, they are an utter joy, and they're well worth the long wait. There's a reason they're such coveted objects, and Phil really is a legend in the pottery world, as I can't think of anyone else who's dedicated their life to making tools for us craftspeople, and he must take such pride knowing that his tools are being used by thousands of potters to trim their pots. So thank you, Phil, and thanks to each and every one of you who watched this video all the way through. And like always, I'll see you next week.